But no, Matt Zinn has reported for us at the 24 7 Sports that Truck Carter is going to enter the portal as a grad transfer. Um, you know, that it's unfortunate from a depth standpoint. And, and and now, after you see it play out, you understand kind of why they got Truck Carter. They got him to be a rotational guy. And I think as insurance, in case there was an injury to one of those top four guys, whether it was Sweat, Murphy, Collins, or Broughton, or maybe Collins didn't take that next step or whatever the case was, you know, Trill Carter probably served his function as best he could for the Texas staff. And now I think you're looking at, okay, for them, it's like Sadir Mitchell, can he step into that role or, or Aaron Brown? I keep saying, Eric, it's a massive offseason for that group of, of third-year tackles. That guy's going to be redshirt sophomores, like Aaron Bryant, Zach Swanson, uh, Jare Bledsoe. Like you're going to need at definitely one, maybe two of those guys to step up and be big time rotational pieces for you. I mean, if not, thank goodness Alex January and DeAndre Robinson are going to be here in a couple of weeks because they're going through spring ball. They're going to have a chance to get into this rotation. So, uh, it hurts from that standpoint to lose Trill Carter. You just lose that buffer you had between the the young guys and necessary high leverage snaps. I'll put it that way. You yeah, don't have Jeff, that anymore now that Trill's gone. Yeah, Jeff, no doubt. I mean, in my mind, you know, some people just you know on our on our board the twenty four seven. I saw you know when I, I wrote a piece the other day, and credit to you, you know, you're the one who planted the seed as far as the you know with Sweat and Murphy leaving and AC coming back. AC and Broughton being the next guys who have a chance to be, you know, kind of develop, right? You know, we saw what mm-hmm. Bo Davis did uh, going back, you know, with Sweat Murphy and, and, and even with Keandre Coburn and Mara Ojimo, right? So you're really having a chance to do that. But I think, in my mind, Trill had to see the writing on the wall. I mean, he's a, he's a veteran college ball player, you know, started three years in Minnesota. You take a look at his snap count. He had over 537 snaps in Minnesota and even uh, the year prior to last was playing over 300, right? To see his snap count reduced. I wonder, you know, Jeff, my mind always goes to expectations versus reality. You said that Trill served his purpose for Texas. I wonder if that was the purpose that Trill knew he was getting himself into, not saying that he regrets the transfer, but when you get your snap total cut in half and your highest snap total of the year is in a blowout against Baylor, you always wonder how that works. But I think in the other thing, again, he had to see the writing on the wall in that. Yeah. You got Sadir Mitchell, you know, you got Jerry Bledsoe, Zach Swanson, Aaron Bryan, all these guys you talked about. And, you know, maybe I'm a little biased against being a Floridian, but I know that Jones program really well, having gone to college in uh, in Orlando. And I'm telling you right now, I think DeAndre Robinson is going to be someone who, again, if he gets here in the spring, you said January as well, uh, out January as well. It mm-hmm. is, you know, DeAndre Robinson gets here in the spring with his size and, and his measurables. If he can hit the ground running, I mean, like you said, he's going to have a real chance to crack that rotation. So all in all, I think in my mind, wasn't the biggest shock in, in my mind. I guess I'm just curious from a, a Trill Carter perspective, what he thinks the next stop is, whether that's, you know, a, a power five stop, a stop or, or, you know, going back to, or going to the G5 ranks and kind of curious how, where his landing space, landing spot may be. Mm-hmm. But all in all, you know, not too stunned um, by that. Not everything it leaves Texas thin, to be honest with you, because I mean, you know, even coming into the year, you were high on guys like Sakira Mitchell and Dre Bledsoe and others. So um, mm-hmm. maybe I'm a little bit higher and optimistic than kind of what I'm seeing in the immediate news of, of Trill's departure. Yeah, I'm just going to go to our scholarship distribution. This is a really good tool to follow at uh, Horns 24-7, our scholarship distribution. Um, so, you know, you lose Sweat and you lose Carter uh, and Murphy. You've got Collins and Broughton are your only upperclassmen. Uh, and then you'll have Bledsoe, Bryant, Bledsoe, Bryant, and Swanson as redshirt sophomores. You have Mitchell as a redshirt freshman. And then Dontre Robinson, Alex January coming in. So you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You'll have eight eight interior defensive linemen on scholarship for spring ball. Like I'm telling you, man, this is probably going to be the most robust spring roster we've seen at Texas. Man, definitely back going back to the Mac Brown days because you're – you know, the guys that you're losing into the NFL, you expected to lose. But with what you've done in the 2022 and 2023 classes and as many early enrollees as you've got in the 24 class, I mean, what are we talking about, 18, 17, 18 early enrollees, um, you're going to have 70-plus scholarship guys. I mean, probably close to 80 scholarships on campus in spring ball. Like, you don't – Eric, you've covered enough spring practices at different places. Like, you don't – you probably got what, like, you know, 65-ish scholarships in the spring. 
Like it's gone from, you know, Sark's first year where you didn't have enough scholarship offensive linemen to field two teams for a spring game. Now it's going to be like, dude, you're going to have to have, you might have to have scrimmages where maybe you hold the vets out, like guys that you know can go. Maybe you hold some of those guys out just because that could be your only chance to get a look at some young guys. So like the structure Sark uses for spring ball is going to be critical to make sure these young guys get some reps because that it's a, trust me, it's a first world problem that we're talking about here. Like it's a great problem to have, but man, it's just, and, and it's probably going to lead, if we're being honest, Derek, it's going to lead to some post spring attrition, which I think anybody that looks at this roster realizes, look at some, at some point, some of these guys to borrow your phrase from earlier, some of these guys will see the writing on the wall and be like, you know what? Um, I just got passed up by this guy that's a class behind me. And uh, yeah, I don't see a path to playing time. So maybe I just need to go do it somewhere else. Um, Again, that's going to be a good problem to have. You're just letting competition sort some of this stuff out. Um, you know, I, I, that's just kind of a tangent for me there in the Trill Carter conversation. But like I said, is Trill Carter a loss? Yes, but it's a loss from a depth perspective. It's a loss from a veteran perspective, from a production perspective. Like you said, we're talking about, you know, right around 250 snaps. That's 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 nothing compared to what you're going to ask some of these other guys to play. And Jeff, really quick, I'll just bounce this off you, you know, and first of all, to kind of cap the point you're making about spring. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I had two years at Florida national, which they went in with 50 and 53 guys. Yeah. In spring, right. So, I mean, that, that it, to juxtapose that to what Texas has completely different, but want to bounce this off you. If you're thinking at best, if Trill sticks around at best, he's the third guy. And it's no disrespect to Trill, but you got to think Vernon Broughton, AC, are, are, are the one no and two, right? at, at best he's a third guy jeff the upside of you know some of the guys behind him right some of the guys we talk about dre bledsoe sadira mitchell and others even aaron mm-hmm. bryant right you're probably thinking yes um those snaps that trill would have played would have been valuable and he probably would have been more in the 300 ish range uh you know high than maybe mid to high 300 ish but i think the upside of some of those guys is, is even better than what you've gotten with trill and quite frankly, probably, you know, some of those guys are going to be better served by getting on the field this year, maybe a little more playmaking ability than a true. I just want to bounce it off you really quick. No, uh, that's the that's that old adage. Um, that's the old adage of, you know, if you've got. If you've got an upperclassman and a freshman and it's close, go with the young guy. Right. You know, and I think there's going to be, you know, Sark has said enough positive things about Jare Bledsoe to make me feel like they're gonna they're gonna be able to find a role for him. I don't I don't, I don't know what it is yet, but they're gonna be able to find a role for him. You know, Sadir Mitchell, they've kind of been priming him to to be ready to step in now in year two, knowing they really wouldn't have to use him in, in year one. Yeah, I, I'm with you hundred percent. I I do believe if if it's close, man, go go with the young guy, go with the upside, especially when you've got two frontline guys with Collins and Broaden going into the SEC. I mean, look, let's face it, man, going into the SEC, it's going to be all hands on deck with with your lines of scrimmage. That's why, I mean, for the first time in a long time, the two deep on the offensive line probably is going to matter just because the the beating you take week in and week out in that league physically. I mean, I put it, I put it in perspective like this, Eric. Like, if you look at – if you look at Texas's schedule in 23 and look at the teams that had seven or fewer wins, so that's your seven and sixes uh, all the way down to your lo- teams with losing records, you're basically going to swap TCU, Iowa State, Texas Tech, Baylor, and BYU. You'll swap those five for Florida, Kentucky, Texas A&M, uh, Arkansas, and I, I forgot, oh, Mississippi State. Yeah, that's a little bit different. It's a, that's a different deal, you know? So uh, it's just a week in, week out. I think that's the toughest adjustment for Texas, honestly. It's just, it's. I don't think it's depth. I don't think it's anything X's and O's wise. I think it's just the, 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 the week in, week out grind that there really are no Saturdays off in the SEC. There are no gimmies on that schedule. And Jeff, you know, it's interesting because I'm self admittedly, I've been tough on the SEC over the past half decade, right? Maybe some of that is from my time covering G5 football, but 
Yeah, Jeff, we're old enough to remember when, you know, Kentucky versus Mississippi State, right? That wasn't quite what it is now. Yeah. Um, and, and I know I've been tough on the SEC saying like, hey, you know, they really are a byproduct of uh, the last 10, 12 years. But the fact of the matter is whether there's validity in that statement, it, it's manifested itself in just a, a talent infusion top to bottom, you know, and, and like you said, there are no Saturdays off. 